sometimes you just have to take the first step. What's up everybody, Brian Tong here and thanks for checking out this video. This is gonna be an in-depth, behind the scenes look with some of the amazing and talented people behind Disney Animation's Raya and The Last Dragon. It's an Academy Award nominee for animated feature and nominee for many other film awards this season and it's already won awards and one of the big focuses for this movie were close-up shots on the face and you're gonna find out about all new eye tech that they reveal here made just for this movie. Plus, I've got at least, what, five or six Easter eggs that the team told me that you have never heard before right here. The interview has also happened over several weeks, so when I say we go in-depth, we go in-depth, and this was just really fun. So if you enjoy this, like and subscribe, and you can come back to my channel for all things tech and geek culture. So let's get to it and talk to the team behind Raya and The Last Dragon. So when I watched Raya, one of the things that stuck out to me, and you know, I didn't know this, but I noticed the facial animations felt like, I don't know if I'm making this up in my mind, but they felt more advanced or more, I don't want to say more attention was paid to them, but maybe it was more of a focus. And so then when I talked to, you know, the press team and Erin, she said that was one of the priorities of really focusing, focusing in on the face of the characters and dialogue. So I'd love to hear from both of your perspectives, how did that factor in your workflow and maybe how it changed things with the focus like that compared to maybe other movies, because there's plenty of action in this movie, but I really felt like, it was very intimate in how we saw the expressions of a lot of these characters. That's, that's a great observation, Brian. I think that with this film, we really wanted to capture the authenticity of Southeast Asian characters, uh, people representation of the culture. It's super important to us. And we wanted to spend that amount of time putting that care into the, the variations, so many variations that the human anatomy and the human form have. So to really capture the Southeast Asian culture, we really wanted to like look at the nose and really look at the cheekbones and look at the eyes and actually, you know, capture that into our characters. You know, we even spent tons of time like getting the monofold lids to work. And, you know, you have extra meat that we don't necessarily work with all the time in our animated features um, uh, on our character side. So it was really important for us to capture that and hone into that you know, that variation that, that the human anatomy has. Yeah, it was, it's, um, it was a different show from our previous shows um, just because of the structures of the eyes. And it's kind of like, they always say the eye is the window to the soul, right? So it's kind of like you have, if you don't get this area quite right, something's going to look wrong in the animation or the animators are going to take a lot longer to get to that point where it's believable um, with the, the performances. So it's kind of like, the, the addition of the monofold lid, the, the eye meat, um, the, even the eye corner, which was all new on the show, um, brought extra life to these characters. I think that it was, a lot, of, it was a lot of work, yeah, a lot of back and forth, and a lot of time was put in to get them just to look. Like yeah, right. And then we also added uh, tear ducts, which we don't really do in any of our characters. So uh, that was something new that we introduced to add a little bit more of the realism and a little bit more of the, the structure that it was needed to, to maintain that beautiful look. Okay, that's, that's crazy because that's probably something that may have subconsciously, I didn't outright say, hey, they have tear ducts, <laughs> but within the expression, I mean, so you, like that little, little, that little notch kind of in mm -hmm. there was, does, was, the, was this the first time you guys had incorporated that into uh, a, a show or a, a Disney animated movie? Yes, that it you was. Know? Oh, wow. Yes. Yeah. So that was another um, uh, example of, you know, putting that much more detail and that much more care into how we modeled and, and posed these characters out. You know, and you guys both made up some really, a really interesting point that I kind of want to revisit. And obviously this is a movie or a film that is focused on characters of a ethnic background, you know, Southeast Asian region that you haven't before. And you kind of both talked about how the, the features are different. So, you know, compared to, let's say, I don't want to say a typical Disney, Disney animation movie, but were there different challenges of just even understanding maybe you guys talked about like I meet and then things like that, <laughs> which I've never heard of before, but I, I get what you're saying. Um, I guess it's, is it the meat around the eye or are you talking about like the lower eye or the upper eye? I mean, what is the eye meat? <laughs> <laughs> I guess 
guess it's terminology that uh, um, that may not be used everywhere. Um, when we typically make eyes uh, for Disney, obviously they're really big and and animate, like just like structured a little bit differently. Uh, not differently, just there's there's variation of different types of eyes, right? So when we when we looked at um, all the diff all the like variety of eyes that are out there in the Southeast Asian culture. Um, you had monolids and you had, and, and they're structured differently, you know, uh, they're, and they also when, when you blink, it's, it's different. So we want to really like, um, reference that and like really put that into our characters to make it believable and make it look right. Um, so when we were doing these, we never really had that in our other films, you know, we had really hard creases for our eyelids and, you know, like really defined eye bridges. And so each structure is different in how we make that kind of uh, adjustment. So it's, it's not, um, yeah, it's not something that, I, I don't know, like it's a, a very kind of subtlety that I, we, like, especially when I was modeling that I wanted to be aware of and that, um, you know, the nose structures were, um, uh, formed in, in specific ways and uh, the cheekbones were formed in specific ways. And uh, I think that was important in our character modeling to really define those features. Yeah, it's mostly that, that this little ridge area here, um, which is just completely different from past shows that we're used to. So I know when I first started Boone, I was, you know, rigging him and, <laughs> sculpting in that one area like we usually do and i'm like this is not working mm -hmm. you know like when you go down or up you yeah. know there are different animated uh expressions that you get with different shaped eyes so we we, we definitely wanted to capture a, a a feel of that and and take care and put put lots of uh you know just just put stuff put our energy into that um yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Do you did you guys have to even with tear ducts? I mean, there's moments where these characters are crying. So did that present new challenges from um, maybe I don't know about your teams directly, but actually I guess that involves animation and effects. But how how actually crying with tear ducts is different than maybe without? Is is that actually <laughs> is there a difference? Uh, well, the way that we did we did it, uh, I think that we did it on past shows like this too we would add like a, a kind of like a cry geo that would ride on top of the, the lid or not the, the bottom lid. Um, what did you call it? What did you call it again? The, it, it'd be like a, a, a geo, like a um, geometry. Um, oh, okay, sorry. That's okay, my okay. lingo that I, I forget that not very many people get. Yeah. I'm just a regular guy. It's just a geometry. I know it's just geometry that you create in the computer. Um, and, you put that onto the eye, but it's hidden. So, um, and then when it when there's a scene that is crying, uh, effects and rigging use that as a, a placeholder so that they can know exactly where that form is is, mm. is uh, developing. Yeah. So it's almost like a line where they fill it with or add water or a moisture effect, and it travels down that line. It, yeah, it's like a like a reference if you will it's like reference where so that way when animation starts uh doing the emotions um of the crying they can reference where that tear is gonna be and then the effects will happen and rigging will be able to control that a little bit better so it's funny that you asked that because not very many people know that that's kind of how we do the tears and i do know on this show i did put in a tear rig so animation could go on off you know, <laughs> really? and then they can just control it from there. So, yeah. yeah. We worked really closely with the character designer up front. Um, and when we were talking about uh, eye shapes, uh, we had a character designer, Shiun Kim, that spent a lot of time um, drawing many different um, styles of eye shapes. And then you mentioned the rigging and modeling process. Um, and then for us, I remember, now can I'm trying to remember, we were taking slow motion videos. Um, I think it was for our, of our PS at the time and just seeing how um, the different 
eye shapes and how that might impact what a blink would look like or some of the different facial expressions. That way, when we were in the character modeling process, we could start to art direct those shapes so that as a character is blinking or going into certain expressions, um, we're getting some of that art direction right off the bat. Yeah, I think that kind of points back to the idea of like one of those things where it's the the way you treated the, the eyes and brows on the last project going into this, suddenly it's like a new set of rules and a new set of ways you would articulate those forms. And I think that's that's a really good example of of kind of like the character team having to get together and try to figure out what's the best way to get that to perform well uh, in the rig because you know, the, the way, uh, you know, I think before that was frozen too, and those characters have, you know, very clear eye sockets. And, and so suddenly we had a, a lot more uh, spans in the rig than we needed there. So, you, you know, we needed to let like repopulate the, so that we can get the, the volumes to, to be preserved properly. Um, yeah. <laughs> they, you know, they also told me that, I don't know if you use this, I'd love to hear kind of, they said that they added tear ducts to the character models on the eyes that they had never done before in a Disney show before. And for people watching the show translates, you know, show is your speak. People are like, Oh, movie. Right. So yeah. I don't know. Did you guys deal specifically with animating anything in regards to those tear ducts or did they come into play? I um, you gotta go ahead. Hey. I think, I mean, it's so funny. I forgot about that. That was like two years ago that we were talking about tear ducts. I'm like, oh, that's right. Um, yeah, we have the I like to dig. I like to dig. We have, we have awesome. the weirdest meetings. We'd have like a tear duct meeting where everybody would come together and discuss the best way to <laughs> model a tear duct and how that would yeah. work. Um, we didn't really do anything in animation with tear ducts. This is actually Raya. We got her on the project. Oh, you name your dog Raya? Yep, this is Raya, the great dame. Yeah. <laughs> but um, yeah, we, you know, that's one of the things that we would build into the rig so that animators aren't having to manage tear ducts so that, you know, they just do what they need to be doing. And then if we need to, we can adjust them. But I don't think we really found the need to. Yeah. But yeah, it gave us a, an added bit of, um, I don't know, believability for the characters. Yeah, and a little bit of that naturalism because there, there's some emotional Raya shot. There's a bunch of emotional Raya shots in the film. And I think that did help with, especially some of those close-ups where you really are just looking at her face and really feeling what she's going through in that moment. So all of those details, it, it, it adds up to just a great performance overall. There's a lot of close-ups and shots on the face with these characters. And I didn't know it at the time, but this is really like a priority as kind of one of the tent poles for this movie to really kind of focus in on that. Mm -hmm. So can you talk about that? We have a face and if we're going in close up, there's a lot, maybe there's things that people externally may not realize. There's so many different ways you can present this, but maybe talk about, first of all, how that was pitched and how your team and you reacted to kind of that focus for this specific movie. I was going to say, when I heard that you wanted to, they said, uh, someone wants to interview about the close-ups in the movie. I was really excited because it was something that I really wanted um, early on. Uh, I work with Adolf Sosinski, who's uh, the director of cinematography for lighting. And we put a cin cinematography pitch together that we work with the directors and kind of this whole thing on that. But um one of the things I really wanted to get into was the close-up. Um, in films that I've worked on before, I've always pushed that. And um, there's, uh, you know, it's director's choice, so they may not be as into it as I am. Uh, but, uh, you know, in the past and in general, uh, there tends to be a, a belief of not getting too close to our characters. Uh, some, For some people, it's getting too close to a CG character, which uh, I've always balked out. I said, you know, our characters at Disney are just amazing between the, the design of the characters, the way they're modeled, the way they're textured, the way they're lit, the way they're animated and rigged, all the detail that uh, we can put in, especially in the face, um, is beyond amazing. So like, to me, that's not a problem. I went to the directors and just said, you know, really like to push on the close-ups on this movie. Um, 
you know, our cinematography was very derived from uh, what's happening to Raya and her journey through the film, as well as Sisu. So like, I, I, like this film is even early on, like this film is going to require close-ups. We're going to want to get in the heads of these characters and, and get as, uh, get our audience as close to them as possible. And for me, that's what the, the close-up really, really embodies. It really helps us get there. One of the things that we really pushed on was uh, sort of the thematics where we had um, different camera and lighting styles based on what was in the scene. And the, the theme of the movie is trust, uh, trust versus distrust. And um, we kind of shot all things having to do with trust one way and all things having to do with distrust the other way to varying degrees, depending on the intensity of the scene. Um, so, you know, when you have the opening of the movie, well, the, the I'm sorry, when you get to tail out in the desert with Raya riding on Tuk Tuk, it's stark in focus, very wide lenses. It's a very harsh mm. look because it's, the world is hit bottom at that point. Contrast that with, uh, you know, shooting Benja in the kitchen, telling her, telling his daughter about why the world has to trust each other. And we've got him super shallowed up the field. Um, we wanted to get a lot of bokeh behind him, you know, the, the circles behind him. So for the set, we actually put in uh, lots of little shiny uh, kitchen objects on the shelves behind him. We can't tell what they are, but they all kick light, little bits of light. So you get lots of little uh, play in there. And other scenes in the movie where um, we actually have Raya and Sisu arguing at the midpoint of the film where Raya says the world shouldn't, you know, no one should be trusted and Sisu saying, you know, you need to, the problem is no one trusts each other. And every time we see Sisu, um, it's all long lenses, super shallowed up the field, and the water is sparkling behind her. Again, we're trying to get that bokeh in there. And on the reverse, on Raya, it's wide, everything's in focus. It's not very appealing um, because her attitude isn't very appealing. So um, that was one of the things we set out to do for the film, which I think we achieved really well. We constantly switched that. Um, and just a way to subliminally uh, get the audience to feel it. Like if the scene is ugly, then you want it to look ugly. You want the characters maybe to look ugly if they're not. And, and the reverse, when they're happy or they're, they're, it's a good emotion. If it's about trust and, and family, then you want to compress that and, and make them all happy and, and cozy, uh, both in the, the camera and the lighting. And uh, that's one of the things that uh, Adolf and I love about the cinematography as well as the crew is like you can we can take what the story is and just push it that much further for the audience to to even if they don't know it even if we're kind of doing it behind their back okay that's that's awesome i mean that that's kind of some of that stuff that people at home when they hear this for the first time and for me hearing the first time i that's pretty amazing just how to add that quality do you can i ask maybe specifically um what app you're using and do you actually have kind of a reference not of looks but you know, you kind of almost reference it as different lens lenses that you use. Yeah. I mean, are we saying with, within the app that you use, whatever it is, do you have settings that you're almost like wide angle lens, uh, uptight, or are you just changing the the zoom on the shot itself? I mean, you know, getting as nitty gritty is, is fine with me. Yeah. So, um, we've always had, uh, camera packages. Uh, we use Maya, uh, always use Maya. Um, and it used to be, we'd kind of just have a single camera that we could just adjust the zoom on. But uh, uh, Nathan Warner, who's one of our uh, other directors of cinematography, uh, when he got his first project on Zootopia, he really wanted to push the idea of a lens package the way a cinematographer does. And it also made our, our crew uh, trying to keep them to only use a 35 and a 50 and an 85. Like, don't use all the ones in between because that's not what happens on a regular set, even though they, there are zoom lenses, which we have those two. So anyway, we have a full lens package. Um, and the camera is... is in the computer, but modeled like a real camera. So uh, the depth of field, the near and far uh, focus, hy or hyperbolic focus, all that is accurate to the lens itself. And then uh, Nathan took it a step further by actually uh, working with the Hyperion guys to actually model real world lenses. Um, I, believe, well, I, don't, I won't say what they're based on because I, I don't want to get it wrong, but <laughs> they're based on real lenses. So each lens has its own set of f-stops that work well for it. So if you're shooting on a 50, you only have access to say a 2.4 or a 5.6 or whatever that is. Um, now for certain, uh, that is the bulk of our work. There are certain times when we can, um, you know, push those ideas and say, you know, I'm going to, 
I'm going to put it on this lens, but I'm going to set it in something that you wouldn't normally do in this kind of lighting. But we try and keep it as as real world as we can. It's it's a it's a it's a balancing act. It likes to feel real, but we also like to uh, push it. But we we'll, we even have like focus breathing. So as the lens, as we rack focus, there's a slight lens change, which is we tend to put the things that they try and get out of lenses that you spend a lot of money to make a lens not do. We put back in just to give it a little more. Um, reality to kind of take that CG stigma off of it. We add, even the, even a lock off has just the slightest bit of keep alive in the camera, just so the pixels are not dead the same every frame. Um, in terms of other, other camera things, but um, we even, you know, we'll, we'll rig the, the, the cameras on dollies and cranes so we get the, the movement to make that as well. So it's essentially a real camera just in the computer. I know you guys both worked on Boon together exclusively, mm -hmm. or did you work on, or you guys were, you were the kind of team, it's your team Boone. Team Boone, yeah. I did team Raya Boone. and I, I modeled Raya and Boone. Um, and then my team did the rest of the amazing characters that you see in the film. Um, I was working with seven other people, um, a character artist, and, um, but we worked on Boone, which Mike said it was the first, one of the first characters that went into the movie, went, which was approved um uh first and so yeah we worked very closely on him and i think the the nuances of like his teeth and you know like the character that he had with his teeth and um you know his eyes and the quirky hair that he has you know um and then of course with animation you know really getting him to emote like such a, a, a jazzy cat kind of guy like hey i got you yeah. you know like i love i loved his his whole his whole character and how it came together so um that's yeah i guess it, it's just the the intricacies that we just put into the characters uh everything went into it uh you know with the feet the the teeth the um, the eyes, the eyebrows, you know, um, I don't know if you know this, but we don't actually model the eyebrows or the hair in terms of like what you see on the screen. Look department does that. So it's like an actual um, like hair fur type uh, look. And we we provide them. Uh, it's called a proxy. And it's just geo that we um, build for the shape of it. It's similar to how we do the uh, the idea tiers where they use that for reference as a visual cue on um, the, the look of the character. And we do the same thing with the eyes. We'll, we'll put geometry where the shape of it is supposed to be so that rigging can then take it and uh, do the emotions with that. And then further on is when, when it gets rendered, the hair and everything will be added to that shape. So it's pretty uh, Im impressive process. So you're telling me someone's job is like eyebrow, uh, su eyebrow supervisor? <laughs> yeah. Basically? No. It's a look I'm... supervisor, but yeah. <laughs> they definitely manicure the, the, the eyebrows and hair and groom that very, you know, precise. And with, with the same kind of feedback and notes that you get, they get drawovers just like we do in modeling. Um, so it's the same kind of iteration process. Yeah. Just... Um, the thing yeah. to keep in mind in rigging is to make sure that those proxies are still following the looked groomed hair or you know eyebrows because if they're off, you're going to hear about it from someone down the line, and uh, <laughs> <laughs> you're going to have to go back and fix that. So. Yeah. so, so if I when when um things come back to normal, and if I walked in your office and I said, "Who messed with my eyebrow geo?" Everyone would be like. <laughs> Like it would actually mean something. Yeah. Okay. But you have, you have to say proxy because that's the, the terminology oh. for the that. Oh. It's still geometry, but we call it proxy because it's a, a reference that you don't actually render in the movie. I'm learning a lot here. This is good. <laughs> so, In a co-head of animation, we don't really get to animate a whole lot on the film. Um, Malkin and I both animated a tiny bit. For me, I was like, I have to work on a Raya shot. I, I love her character. Um, and I love doing emotional moments and really those thinking moments. So I did take a few shots um, and a spot where Raya, when Sisu brings her back to heart and then she sees her dad in stone form. Um, there's just kind of a nice subtle emotional moment there. 
I had so much fun animating that. I loved animating that moment. Um, but mostly Melkin and I spend, we spend a lot of our time in a meeting called rounds, which is where we're just looking at different animators work. Um, we spend a lot of time with the directors in a meeting called dailies, which is where the animators are presenting their work to the directors. Um, and it's more, we, there's a ton of collaboration with the other departments as we uh, complete the film. And I think our entire film working with each of the department leadership was really an amazing experience. And I think both Melkin and I, we talked about this a lot towards the end of, I just didn't want this film to end because it was one of the best projects I've, I've been a part of. And it's a huge part to the film and the story we were telling, but also all the people that we got to work really closely with. And it really felt like a team, even though we were, most of this film was created during the pandemic, um, almost all of production. So we were all from home over Zoom meetings, um, but it it felt like such a, a strong team that I think that's how, how we were able to complete it. I, I did, I didn't do a lot of animation on this one. I, I, I did, uh, I created the, the pose early on for at the end when they all come together, that was something that I really loved in the storyboards. And so early on layout was like, we need a pose in there to, you know, so we can try to set up the cameras. And so I had a lot of fun kind of trying to build that based off, uh, some of John Ripa's drawings he had done in the storyboards. Um, I did a handful of poses or a handful of scenes here and there. But I think what I what I really really loved was like working with the the artist on their scenes and trying to help them push things. Like one of the things that I really love is doing markups, and that's something that when I uh, came to the studio, Glenn Keane was drawing over everybody's scenes untangled, and I just remember like the energy of that and like the mentorship that was there. And and um, yeah, it's interesting. It, it it was a really great experience, and we've been another. Um, interviews where they they would ask about kind of what's what's the big technical thing that you accomplished on the film and and I, I and it feels like this one wasn't as much about that and it was about making a film with each other because it was such a it was like about the people this time yeah and how do we work together when when we're feeling like we're gonna when, when we are isolated from each other I mean I feel like we had to completely reinvent how to communicate as a studio and and how do we, you know, what do we look at things? What, how are we looking at stuff together? What tools are we using? And it, the interesting thing is it felt like it kind of brought us closer together, being apart in a weird way. That was really, was a, was a really nice um, thing to see happen. You, you started to see artists kind of reaching out, you know, even things like, I need a, my back hurts. I need a better chair. Oh yeah. I found this warehouse that has these other chairs down in, you know, uh, Sunland, you get a good, I'll give you the number. You know, it, it just started people to kind of started to kind of reach out and you really felt this like incredible compassion for each other. And I think that's kind of like the studio's superpower is the people that are, are you know, and we're always trying to figure out how to make things. It, it feels like we're kind of making it up as we go every time still, but we're all, you know, helping each other out. And then everybody's kind of willing to jump in when they need to. Um, so that was the thing that I feel like was the most impactful is like kind of seeing how, how great the people can be, you know, given the situation where we kind of came together to make this thing that shouldn't work, you know, like it's hard enough to make these in the building. And then we we have the pandemic and like everybody's internet's terrible, especially my internet's terrible. <laughs> and, uh, like, we're looking at stuff in isolation, you know, it's, it felt like such an impossible thing to do. And then, you know, getting our feet under us as we're getting into production and saying, Hey, this is kind of working and trying, you know, boiling out all of the process stuff that maybe we didn't need. And uh, at the end of it, having, you know, artists feel like those was one of their favorite projects to work on and they felt so trusted and so uh, inspired. And, and, you know, one of the bigger notes we got at the end of it was, you know, I wish I could have done more, you know, I wish, I wish we did. It felt like it ended so quickly. Uh, and that's always a great place to be, you know, at the end of a project. Maybe you guys could talk about the intricacies of Boone, because this is the character that you have spent the most time with. So I'd love to hear maybe some things that 
made Boone unique um, that you both had to focus in on and maybe things that I didn't even realize or saw that you're like, I need to tell you this because I worked on this character and it's very important when you watch Raya again for the <laughs> third time that you look out for this. <laughs> oh, boy, I feel like the biggest thing was his, his, his eyebrows and his eye, eye, eye area. I have, I have uh, one thing that people won't really know about Boone. Um, you know, he's wearing the, the pants, uh, the, the, the wide pants. Uh, I think it's Toti. And uh, they, in, in Sim, it, it kind of sims very realistically. And the legs on Boone were quite thin because he's a thin kid. And so when the animation started, <laughs> the legs look like kind of tent pole in a, a, a baggy pants. So we had to actually balloon his legs out to keep the shape of the everything uh, looking like it wasn't just like a, a, a tent pole in a, a, a tent. So we had to balloon his legs out underneath his pants so that it would keep the shape and form of his leg um, in, a, in a better way. So that was kind of like a, a technical uh, cheat that no one will ever see. Like if you, if you took his pants off, you would see his legs balloon real big and then have normal calves. <laughs> like that's what so, I was wondering was, so he would have like balloon thighs and calves, but when you get to his ankle, it would be like super tiny. Yeah, it would be like the normal Almost ankles like that you see. <laughs> So that was another challenge because we didn't realize that until after we had to get it into the clothing and the performance. And that's mostly so, the cloth collisions against the body. So because if your legs are too tiny, the pants are everything just, collapses. Yeah. So yeah. So you're saying Boone has junk in the trunk? <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Sounds like it. It sounds like he's got he's a big he's got a big boony. <laughs> That's not even funny. <laughs> um, you know, during the course of this movie, were there any other things that stuck out to you guys uh, as, you know, working on? I always love to kind of just unearth and and dig as much as I can. I mean, that's a great, that Boone example, that's a great little nugget. Um, do you have any other fun nuggets, at least whether they're unique to you or not, just working um, on Boone and maybe what other, the other characters that both of you put work into? Yeah, I mean, um, for instance, Tuk Tuk. Um, the, the pill bug that had like an armadillo type shell um, had different segments on it. Um, and animation wanted it to be uh, able to roll up in a ball. And, and in order to do that in modeling, the, sh the sh sheets had to you know slide over and, and be able to stretch over um, to make everything close and open and function correctly. Um, but we realized quickly that because uh, Tuk Tuk is also a mode of transportation, um, that he's kind of like a, a wheel. And in order to get the performance that they needed, we needed to just have a separate uh, character that was a rolled version of Tuk Tuk. So that way, when uh, animation could do the transition between him open on all fours and rolled, they could transfer or they can quickly transfer from the, the rolled version to the untucked version to you know get the performance that they needed. So that was a pretty interesting thing because we had to have two models. We had to track two saddles. We had to track everything on that those saddles um, and two, we called them elements. So uh, there was tuk-tuk rolled and tuk-tuk uh, just tuk-tuk regular. So it was an interesting kind of combination uh, and collaboration that we all had to do with rigging and, and animation. So when, okay, because even at home, we're like, is it Tuk Tuk or is it Tuk Tuk? Tuk Tuk. But it's Tuk Tuk. <laughs> yeah. So when he unrolls himself, is that him untooking? <laughs> uh, yeah, he can actually uh, roll up into a ball and, and, and uh, be on all fours. But then um, it wasn't at the important performance that they wanted when uh, Raya was riding him. So yeah, there there are um, two different uh, characters for that. But as you said, yeah, it like you can still roll them up and and pop them open if you needed to. 
that's a yeah. that's a fun one. I know I go back oh. and forth with Tuk Tuk and Tuk Tuk because before so we were I. kind of like going <laughs> like the names on these these characters have changed so so many times. <laughs> it's uh, interesting. Uh, hey, hey is in the movie somewhere. I know that. Hey, hey is in the movie somewhere. Yes, he is. Adam Green was the supervisor for Hey Hey, and he was he showed a shot in dailies, and he was you know somebody was like, is that Hey Hey? He's like, yep. And then Don do people like, know about this publicly? Uh, uh, I don't know. I don't think so. I, this is know. awesome. Okay, this is the type of stuff I'm talking about. Yeah. So <laughs> Hey Hey is in the movie. Will you give me any guidance? Of which land is it land or territory that uh, Hey Hey might be found in? Yes, he is in somewhere in Talonport. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So keep the, an eye out. <laughs> all right. All right, Malkin. That, that, that's a winner. That's a, that's a big challenge. To, the, the, is it like is it like really like it's gonna be hard? You're just basically uh, saying. He, yeah. <laughs> He's also I'll give you one more kind of parameter. It's not like he's like hidden somewhere tiny in like a big establishing shot. He's significantly in a scene somewhere. Yeah. I think it's just, you know, you're not looking for him, so you don't notice him. Uh, wow. I think that's part of the fun. Like, I love sticking Easter eggs whenever, like we all do in the films, whenever we can. Um, and I, a lot of artists put Easter eggs in their film or in their shots. And it's not always, it. what's cool is it's not always like the obvious thing. Like, it's not always about like... Um, uh, like, uh, you know, can I get Simba in this scene? Because, the, you know, people around the world are going to love that. Like, they're, you know, hopefully Chad's okay with, with me sharing this, but one of the animators on, on Frozen, his cat passed away. And so we, we uh, in the scene we're on is spinning around at the table and eating the chocolates. We organized the loaves of bread, so it said Lily. So that's like... <laughs> you know, and never before heard of Easter egg that only means something to that, that artist, you know, really, I mean, to his family, obviously, but it's not like a, you know, an Easter egg tr that you would traditionally think um, like uh, during Tangled, my wife loved baking cupcakes. And so I was, when there was a scene of Rapunzel holding up a pan of cupcakes, I was like, I got to animate that shot because my wife is doing, you know, she loves cupcakes. She's been baking cupcakes like crazy. So that was kind of like a little Easter egg for her in some ways. And so I think one of the, the really cool like thing about some of these things that people put their personal lives into the films as well, you know, you have the Hey Hey's and the Pinocchio's and all of these things that are really cool to, to try to sneak in there. Like uh, Olaf's nose is in, um, the basket that Moana packs for the, you know, the voyage. I don't think if, I don't think anybody's ever really noticed that his arms are in there too, but um, it's like those kind of things that are really fun. But the, the more meaningful ones, I really like, like, like Chad's Lily, uh, you know, Easter egg or, or um, stuff like that. I think, you know, there's probably so many that we'll never know because they're just personal to the artists working on it, you know, but it's, uh, that's kind of the fun thing. But yeah, hey, he's, hey, hey, he's in there somewhere. I'm sure there are more that we don't know about, you know. One of the things I was just thinking of is towards the, like, beginning of the middle of the film, there's um, one of the animators, it's Raya when we see her um, older and Tuck Tuck. And then there's the kind of our fantasy version of a lizard that jumps off of the cliff. And that was kind of a callback to Frozen 2 with the lizard from their film and in more the mechanics of how the lizard, they look different. Um, but yeah. the movement of it was a callback to Frozen 2. Yeah, he does that funny like little jump. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> have, you had, have you ever put any little Easter eggs or even know of any Easter eggs from from this movie that you that you may be uh, privy to or not? <laughs> trying to remember, I, I, this one did not have nearly as many or um, other movies. It's, it gets very common. I know there are some. Someone to point out, there's some Mickey Mickey ears uh, throughout the film. Um, you have to look really close, like any in Raya. You know, yeah, really. Okay, uh, I'd have like to, hidden I'd Mickey's have to, within the movie. Yeah, just little Mickey Mickey silhouettes. Um, I'd have to. Find whoever sent those to me or wherever it came up. Every character does get their own little um, thing. Like, um, I 
forgot his name. <laughs> Tong? Tong, yes, Tong. That wasn't always his name, so, but <laughs> Tong had the eye patch, so we had to kind of change things, you know, um, you know, the you have to think, how does a baby's face move compared to a, an adult face? You know, there's a lot of things you have to do. How many characters kept their original name? Oh, geez. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, five characters, <laughs> five characters uh, change their names, change their names. Yeah. I don't so know if Ryan, I'm allowed to say what their name, previous names were, but yeah. How about, what if, how about this? What if you tell me and then they'll get it approved or not? Because this is, they probably won't approve it, but <laughs> Raya's name is one of the few then that stayed the same. No. Oh, I can't what say anything though. I'm not saying anything if it's not public knowledge. Can confirm or deny. <laughs> you know, I can't confirm. Or deny. <laughs> okay. Okay. But, but the nugget is that five of the characters did have different names. Did some of them have not only a different name, but multiple different names? No, like, I, I, maybe. Yeah. Okay, how about this? Can you at least say, I'm not trying to probe too much. Can you at least say, you said Raya had a different name. Can you tell me the other characters who did at least have a different name originally? Well, they might not have been named either. Until yeah, well, uh, Tong had a different name. Um, I'm glad uh, you changed his name to Tong because my last name is, I'm Brian Tong. So uh -huh. that was a great decision. Great decision, guys. <laughs> so, um, Boone had a different name. And... Um, uh noi yeah noi had a different name and the ongis had a different name i don't even know what their names are well we had a uh, element name yeah I, I think they they didn't have a different name they just didn't have a name mm -hmm. um we had an acronym that we used for them uh called mtams <laughs> and that was uh an acronym called that was monkeys that are not monkeys, that aren't monkeys, the MTANs, because <laughs> they're catfish monkeys. And uh, so we thought that was appropriate for, for them at that time. Um, but yeah, um, and then the dad had a name shift, I think. Um, so yeah, there were a few characters because the story had changed and uh, they were trying to find the characters. There was a lot of back and forth, um, you know, between what, what the names were going to be, you know, officially. Um, but yeah. Uh, and also just to let you guys know a little tidbit, cause you were saying that you wanted like information about characters that you may not necessarily know, uh, they're the teeth, uh, on Sisu were actually modeled from Aquafina, like, uh, based on Aquafina's uh, teeth before they, she got them fixed. So it was, a, a fun little kind of putting a little bit of her into the character. You know, that that's interesting you say that because I did see that, but I never I never thought of it. I'm like, oh, it, her teeth kind of look like her teeth, but in a dragon mouth, if, if that yeah. makes sense. <laughs> it's, yeah. it, it did. Yeah. Okay, that, that, that's a cool fun, that's a fun one too. <laughs> yeah. I love the name thing. That, that kind of blew my mind actually. Five <laughs> characters? Yeah. And Raya was not the original not name? not more, but I can't think of yeah. uh, the other ones, but yeah. Um, but who knows if you can use that or not? I don't know. <laughs> well, you know, we never revealed the original name, so it doesn't change the yeah. uh, integrity of the film. <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah.